as well as joining the Thor Inside Patreon that I always mention at the end of the video, one of the best ways you can support me and my content here on the side channel is by buying a delicious portion of Gamer Subs and getting yourself 10% off your order using the code THORIN, T-H-O-R-I-N, at GamerSubs.gg. I often shout out my favourite flavours like the Citrus Lemonade, Guacamole Gamer Fart 9000, but there's a few other ones I also enjoy, like I actually quite like the Clyde's Black Cherry, that has quite an interesting profile, Arctic Cooler, I'm not even sure what that is supposed to taste like, it's green and that's an appropriate colour, it's kind of a very strange but somewhat compelling flavour, Blue Raz, Blue Raspberry is a classic, you can't really go wrong with, and of course, I do have my Patreon, but if people don't like Patreon, just like on my main channel that I'm busy setting up, I will in due time make YouTube memberships here on the side channel, so there'll be an easier way to pay as well, if you just don't like the Patreon platform. Now, when I did this video, top 10 comic book films, first things first, I didn't include any anime, so... Take all Japanese anime out of the equation, any Korean stuff. I generally didn't really, if you go and look, like didn't really sort of include much like European comics and stuff. Like we're not really going to say like Mobius means that you can do like the fifth element or whatever. Yeah, I'm not really doing that sort of approach. These are more like sort of in general Hollywood comic book films. Although I've put a few in there to be a bit sneaky. And I will also say... I mean, there's one that you might say is somewhat similar to manga, but I will say it is a Western comic. It just obviously paid homage to and used the medium of, of manga, as we'll get to later. So I didn't include any anime. I also, in general, just, I think this is just good form, actually, when you make top tens, is I think you just get, even though it's inherently my top ten, it's not supposed to be like factory, it's like Thorin's top ten. I do think that, since I'm going to like certain things, for example, I don't think it that makes that much sense to include like sequels of films in this. You just take up valuable slots that I think are better served. Mainly, this is more like people want a nice smorgasbord, as they say, right? Whereas I actually think if there's multiple films in a series are all of a similar level, then you kind of just like waste the time you put both in, except unless they were so good. Like if it's at the top of the list, maybe you have to. So for example, if I was to put one of the Christopher Nolan Batman movies in, I wouldn't put one of the other ones right because if you like the second you probably like the third if you like the third you almost certainly like the second right so to me they can be somewhat interchangeable just pick the one you like and put that one in there similarly if you like superman films for example if you like superman one you also like superman two if you like superman two you like superman you get the point so in those ones i think you just pick the one you think's the best and you put that one there and there's going to be some surprises. Like number 10, I'll start with number 10 and we'll do this one. This isn't just head off. This is actually going to be a countdown. They've put them in an order. Now, obviously, I'm sure there'll be some films I might have forgotten about, but I think I did a pretty good job with this one. It's pretty spicy. So we'll start number 10. Already, you can tell I was willing to go a little bit further afield than just Hollywood. This is Hollywood, but I mean, in terms of like just getting like a famous comic and making a, a paint by numbers abc film because number 10 immediately will come from the uh, indie comic scene this is of course going to be american F splendor a 2003 film by a bunch of directors you won't be aware of and it's obviously a biopic of a real comic book author who did his own indie series called american splendor and basically, it's about a guy called Harvey Picar, who was an indie comics guy. Think of like Robert Crumb and people like that. He was in that same vein. By the way, it's a peer of Robert Crumb's. He's, Robert Crumb's even done things in American Splendor. By the way, if you've never seen the, the classic di um, documentary Crumb, check that out, of course. That really is like a, a, a door into this world and what these people were like. And they're kind of compelling, if somewhat sleazy characters. Paul Giamatti plays the main character, the protagonist, this real guy. But you you also get the real guy too who's in it and they sort of blur like they do some parts that are sort of fictionalized versions of it they do put some parts that are the real people talking and it's basically a biopic it's about this guy's life and his ups and downs trying to make a comic so the things he goes through with his health his relationships etc what else is this i'll try not to tell you too much about it because i actually don't think people are going to be very familiar with this guy or with the particular indie scene and actually the less you know probably the better for this one it's better if i don't spoil anything what else is it's sort of an all over there film like it's a bit of a slice of life but it's also got some gonzo aspects to it he's behind the scenes of an industry it's quirky because he's a very weird unusual people it's kind of a film that i would say is funny but it's also got wholesome aspects to it, it can be heartwarming it's, it's a very real film it actually doesn't have too much hollywood artifice generally like i say it blurs fiction 
and reality and it kind of does try to like tug on the heartstrings a little bit but in a way that are sort of well-intentioned if a very commodionly figure is the person delivering the message or sort of that the theme is based around so i think the first one probably a bit of a surprise from out of left field but i'll say is check out the film pretty good fucking film by the way also i really do take like best films like this is a very good film it's not like the best in terms of like the most comic-y film ever. Obviously, it's not really a superhero movie either. Not as I didn't say 10 best superhero movies. But I would say this fits within this category. Then we're going to go to number nine. And that is 1980s Superman 2, which was obviously directed by Richard Lester. And immediately after reference, obviously, that the problem was it was in the end directed by Richard Lester. But before that, it was written directed by Richard Donner, wasn't it? Obviously, the guy who did Superman 1, and everyone presumably loved Superman 1, thought it was brilliant, but they had some sort of a falling out. He didn't get to finish this film. I will say, if you've ever seen, like, the Donner cut, I think that is garbage. It's not, like, put it this way, like, the Schneider cut is worth watching as a film. Like, that even could have been on this list. I really considered putting that on this top 10. Spoiler, it actually didn't make the cut. I just think, in the end, it's probably too long and a bit too indulgent for some people. I actually really enjoyed it, but I just don't know that it's in my top 10, though. That's a problem. I don't know how I would revisit it over the years. The Donner cut, the problem is he's just not working with enough footage, and also the ending is just stupid because it kind of copies the first one, which, by the way, the ending of the first Superman, one of the worst parts of that film, isn't it? Like, it's it's a ridiculous day sex back that doesn't even really make any sense, really, even though they're trying to just be like, oh, forget comics, it's movie magic, folks. Like, so I'm talking about the Richard Lester version. I don't care that there might have been some dispute and people on the set didn't like the movie he made is a good film. By the way, if you want more Richard Donner stuff to do with Superman, what you want to do is check out the Jeff Johns book, The Trade Paperback, The Last Son, which he helped sort of inspire part of the writing of, or maybe even wrote part of the script or something. I'd just say check out that. It's got a pretty kind of cool storyline to it. The cool thing about this film for me is it's one of the only superhero slash comic book films that actually manages to truly create tension when you're not a child anymore. When you're not just a kid who just reacts, oh my goodness, oh, and I hope he's okay, oh my god, oh, they're so evil, they're going to kill him, no, boo. When you're actually an adult and you can think about these things and you sort of know, nah, that character will never die like that. Oh, come on, he's obviously going to get out of it. Oh, they're shooting him, we're going to see Superman. That sort of thing does set in. You get a bit jaded when people do it too obvious when it's something like Superman. By having the Kryptonians come down without giving too many spoilers and impose their will upon the world and there's only one Kryptonian Superman against them. That is actually quite scary. Like, they successfully, with the whole thing of coming down to the White House, they managed to make you feel like... What would it be like if someone with the powers of Superman actually wasn't benevolent? They weren't nice to humans. They didn't consider us like lovely and think of like truth, justice. And the, what would it, what could they do? I know people are gonna think, yeah, but they already explored that in Man of Steel. First of all, Zod is way better in this one. And then secondly, I think they even can, even though this is a wacky '80s movie, they managed to carry off the sort of like idea that they're coming down and fucking everything up, and it's really dangerous. I think even better than that from that film, just essentially just goes right, just make it like loads of like massive special effects, a bit of smash. That is all. A a fucking Godzilla versus King Kong movie like that that wasn't even Superman to me and then the ending is pathetic on that one so one thing I actually like about this film as well is even though I would have my, my problems if someone in reality wanted to be like this I think for the character they do a good job as well with the whole like he's a wimp when he's Clark Kent but then he tries to be bold in this particular one because of the mechanism of the film but then when he's Superman he is this like a Polonian fucking figure who does almost feel like a Greek god, like he's sort of a little bit above us, even though he's incredibly magnanimous and obviously cares about humans and the world and doing the right thing, etc. He actually has that aspect of when he's Superman, you do feel like he's untouchable. When he is Clark Kent, though, you feel the humanity and you feel about how he's how his emotional state is more fragile and when he baby becomes human, you see the humanity in him. Then also, let's throw this out there, this is an interpretation you've never heard. I don't think we'll ever get to this movie on four player. So here's my angle I would have given Richard. I think you can even argue with the whole thing of like, I want to give up my powers and my birthright to be with like a human woman I really love and just have a human mortal life and I'm willing to die as well. This is almost some, I wonder, everyone obviously knows within the character of Superman, there's already enough allusions to Jesus and the idea of Jesus being born on earth and sending your son to help the world and be a symbol and all. 
uh, there's all that already. But you could argue this is almost like Last Temptation of Christ, isn't it? This is like, you know, should he embrace being a god, but no, he has to be somewhat alone as a result to do what must be done? Or should he basically say, no, maybe I'll actually say, I don't want that. I'm going to eschew that lifestyle. I'm just going to become just a man, a mortal. I'm going to just be with a woman because of my love for a woman, right? Which is more important, love of humanity in the world or love of a woman in my life and what I feel about people. There's even that sort of dynamic being played at here. I also think it's just got a really satisfying satisfying ending if you can just enjoy if you like Superman 1 and you haven't seen this one you're almost certainly gonna like it and if you're just in general like sort of like wholesome old school style superhero movies I think you're just gonna love the ending to this one it's just a really satisfying ending if you think of some of the cast they all do a great job in this one Christopher Reeve can be so human but then he also can be seemingly other and very sort of like sturdy in his performance when he needs to be and polished. Gene Hackman as Lex Luthor. They make him hack it up a little bit because he's supposed to be part of the comedic relief, but he is also a very good actor, one of the all-time Hollywood greats. And when he wants to, he can provide gravitas to a scene and play this character well. Obviously, they do make the slapstick element. I wish the Otis character just wasn't in it, basically. Um, Terrence Stamp is terrifying as Zod. He's way better than the fucking guy in the reboot, the remake, right? I think he's, this this is one of the great British actors. And me... He has, a, he has sort of a force to him where before like something happens with the mechanism with powers, of course you're worried about this guy taking over the world and getting revenge on Superman. Of course, it's all there. Like I actually think what's great about this one is it really is a film about Superman. The other ones are like Superman in the world. Superman, what does Superman do? How would Superman do this or have a go? For... This is actually about Superman and his past and who he was. Is that why I think it's one of the best comic book films, actually? Then we're going to go... Number eight is going to be V for Vendetta from 2005, which was directed by James McTeague, who at the time was a nobody and directed any films at that point in time. Now, a lot of you incorrectly might think, wasn't this produ Wasn't this directed by the Wachowskis? It's like, no, no, as far as I know, they produced it. So they oversaw it. And he's apparently like one of their minions because he did like the Sense8 thing and some other stuff for them. And so I'm guessing they had a decent amount of seeing it. But it wasn't one of their films, by the way, so don't credit it to them in the way that people sometimes do. If you haven't read the graphic novel, the problem is it's a good movie in its own right. It's a good film. You can just enjoy it. I, I actually think the material within it that it keeps true and the best scenes in it, even making at times feel like a very good movie. There's times where you're going, wow, this is this is a really good comic book film. They're like, man, this is really hitting. Like some of the scenes, one of my favorites, obviously, is the one like I had roses. I think that scene is fucking unbelievable. I think that's it. Just, if, you, if you don't ever plan to watch the movie, just watch that scene on YouTube. Like that. that in the comics is incredibly powerful, but they translate it to the screen. It's really good. I do think from the comic, for example, they didn't translate the stuff of sort of like when it's like the man from room five it's like that that hits a lot harder in the comic and then i also hate that they took the in the inspector guy and they don't have his whole sort of quest of where let's just say he changes his consciousness as a way to get in the mind of the, it's just a, a clever angle to do it almost reminds me of like element of crime from lars von Trier trying to get in the mind of a psychopath or something it's kind of a, a it's a creative artistic piece of license to get from one point to another. they don't do that in this and they change some of the fundamental aspects obviously in the early it was a bit more like le resistance sort of like politics back then we all know what happened to the anonymous mask etc like so the less said about all that the better the problem it has is if you do know the graphic novel and what it could have been it, it doesn't hit its mark like if the graphic novels are 10 out of 10 i believe it is then this is like what 7.5 out of 10 a 7 out of 10 depending on how you feel all in all moments feel like an 8 out of 10 but all in all it doesn't quite make it there i mean one thing it does do that i do think is a problem from the original is it does pervert a central theme in the book which is that idea that he is just a man it is not important what his identity is beyond that this regime did something to him literally and it changed him and then he had the abilities to actually come as a martyr and wreck everything the idea that it really was all just about his relationship to the evie character and he sort of did it all for her that undoes so much of the gravitas and the power and the vibrancy of what that character was about in the book and what he represented. And then I'll just throw this out there, the whole eggy in a basket. Fuck that noise. Just fuck that noise. I mean, the funny thing is, I could make a whole separate thing. Maybe I'll do a short video or even a whole video on this one time. But this is another character, V, where if you look how Alan Moore treats him at the end of the novel, it's like, he must be killed. He had to die. Like, Alan Moore has this really strange relationship where because his whole shit early on was let's take characters from this fantasy world where they're all protected by these co comics codes and they're all just ridiculous, like, simplistic 
primary color characters and let's take them and bring them into our world with postmodernism and this sort of thing and ask what would it be like in real life if someone tried to be like Batman or something. What's funny is that sounds like a really stupid idea. If that was implemented by a lot of people as it was by Hollywood, they'd mess it up. Not this particular film I'm talking, I'm talking in an abstract here. But the funny thing is, when Alan Moore does that, he's such a brilliant writer that even in spite of his politics and opinions, he will just create brilliant scripts and brilliant comic books. So what's funny is, when he then tries to make a hero who's a martyr who goes against the bad guys in a thing, he manages to come up with Rorschach V. So characters he on some level doesn't like and clearly doesn't like certain aspects of it, thinks you shouldn't be like, and that are monsters, but who are the most morally upstanding characters, arguably. I mean, he'd say within this one, it's the inspector or the detective, obviously. But you, there's an element to which he succeeds too far and you can tell the character gets out of his control and is done too well. And so Alan Moore has this weird sort of love-hate affair with his protagonists or the central, the anti-hero even sometimes. Because the, when he makes them go into the real world, he makes them too well-rounded and too sort of like grey in some regards and then or not grey in the regards that you'd want a character to stand for what's right etc by the way like I say it could probably be its own video there I'll just throw this out there as I've alluded to the comic is incredible the graphic novel this is unbelievably good I mean the funny thing is I sometimes think a problem with comic books is if you tell, if someone says, which one should I start with? And you say, get Watchmen and V for Vendetta. They're going to find it. Oh, wait, both came out a similar sort of time in the 80s and by the same graphic. They're going to think, oh, this is just like anime where someone says, check out all these ones and then the sequel and then the other one and then the prequel. No, no, actually, it just happens that this guy is so uniquely incredible at comic books writing that yes, when he first got his real chance to do big projects, he knocked out the park with 10 out of 10s. It's, you can't, it's it, like what's bad about Alan Moore is in music, yeah, I do think the Beatles are mega overrated. In other fields, yeah, some of these people are just for the plebs to think they're the best. Mate, Alan Moore is just the truth. Like, it's not even, you, you can't, you can't overstate how good he is at comic book writing. So, this is one of the best ones of his work. Then we're going to go. To number seven, which is going to be probably a surprise to some people, it's going to be 2018's Avengers Infinity War, which was, of course, directed by the Russo brothers. I'm not a huge fan of it, but whatever. They did a good job on this one. What I like about this film and why it's on this list, first and foremost, is the scale and the scope is fucking mega. This is why I've waited for, for years and years from comic book films. I was so sick. I've even done a video on this channel about comic book films. I hate when they're just self-contained. I hate it in that fucking Judge Dread film when they just shut down that building and you're like, oh, it's just that fucking like attack the block or whatever. So I'm never going to get to see the rest of Mega City 1. I'm never going to get to see the like wilderness and stuff. I'm never going to go to the other Mega I'm not going to do any of that. And the halls are just, I'm just in this one place. It's, it's, I've already limited the character and where it can go. Meanwhile, you could have this crazy sandbox you could have played with. I can't handle that. That does my head in. All the million comic book movies just reboot and over the origin story, the origin story, the origin story, the first two main villains, the first two main villains. Meanwhile, there'll be characters where it's like, do we ever get to see Superman? Man go into another dimension, go see the Legion of Superheroes. Do we ever get to see him like go and see Monel or, or go to another fucking planet or fight like Mr. Metiplex or whatever? Do we no we never do? It's always just fucking Lex Luthor. It's always just real estate scams. Like that's the thing I hate. My complaint was always the lack of ambition and galactic cosmic level threats. Because that's when characters like Superman and the Fantastic Four get fucking sick. Instead, it's just Superman stopping people doing real estate deals in the 80s, because the 80s was about scamming people on real estate, wasn't it? Yeah, I know, look, I do get part of it because Fantastic Four and the Green Lantern kind of flopped and didn't take off. Although I actually think those two Fox Fantastic Fours are pretty good and well cast. They're just fun movies. They're above average, certainly. Also, that bad guy from Nick Tuck did a fucking banger role as, um, what's his name? Doctor Doom, didn't he? But obviously some people don't like him. And then also... You just think of some of the things they've done as like they've done Swamp Thing as a TV series and movies, but they're not ever going to do the Alan Moore one and go into fucking space or whatever, are they? Like that super sick storyline he did. So, so I never thought we'd actually get this. I mean, especially when they did that Fantastic Four reboot and then it's like, or whatever, well, no, the second one or whatever, where like Galactus was just a cloud. It wasn't actually Galactus. Like I talked to the fucking, um, like I talked to that guy about with, with, uh, about how I hated that angle. Obviously, I had a different opinion. So to me, what I love about this is it feels fucking epic. This actually, this in some ways, look, it's not as good, but sort of like, it has like modern day Iliad aspects to it. By the way, one thing that's great about this is obviously the central character actually is Thanos. If we're being real, he is, he's basically, the, the story's his story. And by the way, I would say it's a very good characterization of Thanos. The idea that he actually, he is having to really sacrifice. He has loss and he clearly suffers from it. He's not just a brute. If you don't know, in some ways, 
Thanos is the Marvel sort of counterpart of like DC's Dark Side, but Dark Side is just an evil bastard who just only cares about evil and everything has to be dead and like him and evil. It's just like just despair. Like this guy actually, there's no ones here. The joke is you can root for this guy in a way. You can sort of vibe with this guy in a way. Sometimes you might even think he has a point, right? Now we'll see. That's part of the problem of this film. It's clearly sort of predictive programming to me. Check out the Drew Tag episode because he's obviously like setting up and making arguments. I'd say some of them have soft involved for a depopulation agenda right particularly the sentiment that like humans should accept this and it's necessary and what can you do and maybe we have to do this to make things fine for the other people so there's a bit that's a bit dark there also then there's the whole thing that like in the second film it's set up so iron man can beat it which is a clear parallel to someone else like the drew tang episode alluded to that's a bit too on the nose for me but you know what the fact that spoilers he actually gets to win that's pretty cool. I'm so sick of these, them making really cool superheroes that I'd have really good, and, and villains that I'd have really good, like, reasons and actors. Like, an obvious example would be, like, fucking Skeletor in Masters of the Universe, the one from the 80s. It's fucking sick, the actor that plays him, if you don't know him. And then, obviously, that ending scene when he gets to get, but you are, you know he has to lose. You know he has to be humiliated at the end of the humiliation ritual must be completed. There is no humiliation ritual in this one. What's great is he gets to win because, quite frankly, he should win at this point in this one, right? It's actually well done. It's not like, what the hell? Why did he get to win? The joke is, this is a good example of subverting expectations. Even the whole, like, should have gone for the head? Yeah, he should. That's the problem with these stupid superheroes, right? They're coming from this silly sort of kid's world. It's like, oh, don't really kill people. And then it's like, no, this was the threat and you didn't eliminate him, mate. And he's, and he's actually done it. His, his game plan worked out and you all panicked like plebs just reacting. And he's, and he's actually beating you. I think it's very, very well set up. Then, because you haven't watched the second film yet, we think of all the other movies. Don't go watch all the Marvel Cycle, but just watch a couple of the big ones that you like, or the actors that you like. I think most of them are shite, I have to say, or just seven out of ten paid by numbers style movies. But I'll tell you what, the deaths feel meaningful in this film. Even if, yes, just like the comics industry, they cynically bring a bunch of them back in the second film and undo it. It doesn't matter. We had to wait a while before the second film came out. When you watch this one, I'd even suggest, by the way, don't watch the sequel. Look, watch it to find out what happened. But this is one of those ones like The Matrix. So you can just pretend the sequels don't exist. And this is a mega standalone movie. Yeah, you got to know some of the other characters. I already know all of them from comics anyway. But it's just a good, really good movie to pretend it doesn't have a sequel. It's a really cool movie, right? What does it even say about the world if there isn't a fucking sequel? Hey, that's pretty wild. So yeah, I think, I mean, people are going to go, this is a big obvious box office one. It doesn't matter. If something's good, it's good, mate. This one actually delivered. I'm not even a big Marvel fan. I actually think this might upset people. Like I alluded to, I might have put the Snyder Cut on here. I actually think the DC cut movies are more interesting than these Marvel ones. I think some of the Marvel ones, a couple of them are better. But actually, in general, I like the ambition of the DC ones. And the fact that they had the balls to go for it. At least Snyder went for some different angles on some of his and did some interesting things. So yeah, there's a little edgy take for you, right? Number six. Oh, some people are going to hate this. And as I said, this is the one where I'm sort of cheating so I didn't use anime because this is obviously manga inspired if you just know the actual comic book in real life. An indie comic book if people don't know. Scott Pilgrim versus The World from 2010 directed by Edgar Wright. Now, first of all, doesn't everyone like Edgar Wright's films? I mean, his comedies are good. I do think they're overrated but that's everything with Simon Pegg except Spaced. I actually think that Almost everything I think right is worth watching, right? He's all, and I I would say here's a banger for you. I think he's a British Tarantino. He knows all the classics. He grew up on all the classics. He's obsessed with certain directors, and he clearly takes elements of what he liked and thought was cool about American cinema generally, and the directors he likes, and then uses them to recreate scenes, do homages, and and kind of tell the story. It's, there is that tar Tarantino sort of collage slash tapestry component to how he tells his films. So in this one, he's obviously adapting a comic book. By the way, really good comic book as well. If you ever go, it's actually, if you like this film, you can really like the comic book. It's way better. It's got way more to it. The characters develop more. There's more story, etc. Just one of those ones where it's really good. I've never understood, bearing in mind how popular Edgar Wright films are, that people hate on this film. Because holy fuck do they hate on this film. I even know people who like Scott Pilgrim comic books who hate on this film. I don't get it. What's not to like? This is a really fun, punchy, creative daring, unique movie. I love the implementation of the video game stuff. I think the cutting slash shooting style is so well done. It's so slick. It's so smooth. It's so stylish. I think the cast is fucking mega. 
Even people like that ginger woman, the one who was in the fucking newsroom who plays the drummer, even she's well cast, and I find that actor fucking annoying, really annoying. I actually am not even a Michael Sarah fan. He's banger as the central role. The Ramona Flowers actor, she does a great job. It's just really well cast, this film. It really is. Even some of the other figures in it, you just look at it, and especially, by the way, if you know the comic, they've actually done a really good job based on what the comic characters are like, sort of finding a Hollywood equivalent and analogue you can translate it to and keep most of the soul of the of the sort of character and the soundtrack's mega the soundtrack's mega integrated and it's just really good isn't it so I'm like what's not to like about the, the joke is i think this movie should have had sequels and i wish it had gotten so successful that the writer himself had to do extra sequels of the books and then we could have had like five of these movies and edgar wright could have directed them all i think it's just a fun self-contained film i don't get what people hate about we're into the top five now number five Sin City from 2005, directed by, interesting detail, obviously Robert Rodriguez, but also Frank Miller. And actually, Robert Rodriguez had to do something mad, like give up his like SAG membership or some sort of like an actor, a director's guild or whatever type thing. Because technically, if you're in one of those things, you're not allowed to work with people and give them directing credits and positions if they're not actually in that guild or whatever. And apparently, I think they said Frank Miller wasn't or something. Also, one of the scenes, I think it's the car chase scene, the one with the gun in the head or something. One of the scenes is directed by Quentin Tarantino. If people don't know, you'd have to look into it. I'm pretty sure I'm right on that one. Um, so first of all, the reason why I bring up the Frank, Mil the Frank Miller aspect, by the way, if you don't know Frank Miller, not only wrote these comic books, he wrote The Dark Knight, which is basically the one that like, The Dark Knight Returns, which is basically what The Dark Knight clearly has massive parallels to, even though the story is very different. So what I would say is this, the reason why I bring up the directing angle is because I don't think it's a coincidence that this is probably the most faithful comic adaptation ever in the best possible way. Like, somehow they really did translate it to the screen. Now, here's the reason why, though. Because unlike a lot of Alan Moore comics, it makes sense to translate this one-to-one -to, -one to the screen if you can, because it's basically written as a pastiche slash homage to film noir. Because one of the best things about Frank Miller's style of art is doing, one, violence, and two, things that involve a lot of dark and shadows, hence why he comes from the world of Batman. And his whole style in art, if you don't know, is to use negative space, to use, like, areas to, like, to do the inverse of the image, or suddenly the inv image comes out from what he didn't show. He, he does that sort of thing. So the shadows in this movie, the black and white in this film, it translates really, really, really well. The beats hit really well. And so I actually think, obviously, he had a film noir massive influence when he wrote this. And you watch, like, they have translated it to the screen. And the cast for this movie, this is, whoever did this, Chef's Kiss, this is one of the best casting jobs ever in Hollywood. Like, Bruce Willis is fantastic. Obviously, Mickey Rock, everyone knows, killed it as, like, Frank or whatever. Clive Owen is a good job of casting. Uh, Benicio Del Toro, great job. Even some of the people who play the really bad villains. Again, how could you nail it more with some of these? I think this is, this is genuinely, like, the funny thing is, the comic is still better because the art of Frank Miller is so good and the way he lays it out on the pages. But this is a fabulous movie. I mean, the fact that it's number five tells you how actually I, highly I regard some of the other films. Like, there's a world where, if I didn't watch something, this could have been number one. This might be the best comic book film. Like I said, it's the best adaptation. I think it's just a really, really strong movie. Even the sequel, which took way too long to come out and be done, it's still good. It's just not as good. And I think, just, I, think I don't know, maybe the time had moved on. Somehow it feels like it's trying to do the same thing, but it doesn't hit the same way, even though it's also got a very good cast number four is x2 aka x-men 2 aka i mean x-men united i think was actually the name of like the dvd where they gave you like x2 and x-men so x2 aka x-men 2 from 2003 directed by brian singer i actually think when this movie came out this film it was the best comic book film at the time it was a, it's a serious treatment but admittedly, it's the early 2000s, so there's still got to be some comic elements and some of the suits are going to look the same. But it has a bit of the levity in there because they are superheroes. At the end of the day. They were still trying to appeal to kids slash teens. But it is way better, in my opinion, at blending comic elements, serious elements, and film elements than the modern-day Marvel movies. This one is really, really good, in my opinion. Like, the Magneto stuff is just absolute chef's kiss. I mean, Ian McKellen is fantastic as Magneto, and if you like the character of Magneto, he was good in the first one, X-Men, but man, what they give him to work with here, where he essentially becomes an anti-hero, oh, it's fabulous what he's able to do in this film, and the storyline is so cool with him, it allows you to have these multiple angles where you're, you're pulling for certain people, even though you know later they're going to be enemies, or they might be against a different agenda, but now you need them on your side. 
the whole thing with the helmet, why that's going to protect you from the real bad guy, his arrogance, the fact he is an elitist, obviously speciesist in this sense, um, his escape from prison is fucking dope. That even the way he uh, treats that pyro character, it's one of the few characters that Charles Xavier couldn't get to, right? Remember that whole thing he has that line about, you know, those bad mutants? Like, I'm one of those. Like, that's fucking fire. Also, if you are some sort of disaffected teen, you're going to fucking love that angle. Um, I actually think, by the way, the pyro magneto element was one of the most offensively bad elements of the third film. That's why The Last Stand is actually a dog shit film. They could have done so much with that. And again, just pretend that movie doesn't exist and you can just go, hmm, imagine what they might have done with that story. The villain angle is really good. If you know who the villain is and you know the comics background, it's really well set up. It is a terrifying one. It's a brilliant actor, Brian Cox. It allows for Magneto, as Magneto and Lex Luthor sometimes do, even the Joker sometimes does in comics, if it's a really big a threat or sometimes threatens their person that they're the antagonist of who they want to battle and defeat they'll sometimes join up it's like enemy of my enemy is my friend in this instance that we have to so it's a very clever plot to actually get magneto on their side and the whole striker son angle asks a lot of interesting questions about mutants and about the fact that like people could use their own son but at the same time be using it to battle the mutants but then also hate the oh there's so much this has obviously got elements to do with like what would you do if you had a disabled child and what do you feel about it all by the way just as an aside i want to a beautiful way of looking at that which is maybe when people come to this realm for whatever reason maybe people who are heavily disabled like that just need extra love and attention and they just needed to come into an incarnation in which everyone was just lovely to them and just looked after them and just gave them sort of peace as it were it's just an interesting angle but obviously the problem is what would a military man in this particular era think especially then if he himself is battling mutants it's obviously got hinting eugenics components right his own son essentially is the weapon to destroy people like his own son. And then it just has a very clever use to tie into this of using Cerebro. I think that was always there in the comics. It was in the animated TV series. It was in the first one, but what a, what a cool way to use it to flip the narrative and make it a tool for evil, right? The cast is fabulous in this as well, as well as Hugh Jackman and Patrick Stewart and all the people that were in the first film. I think like Alan Cumming does a great job as Nightcrawler. What an inspired piece of casting, right? Obviously you have... Um, I think it's, like I said before, I think it's the best blend of serious fun and then a little bit of cheesy slash comic vibe without just being stupid permanent Chandler being Marvel one-liners that they just insert in every one of these movies non-stop now. This actually tries to tell a proper story as well as any that are in the comics. I think it does a really good job with it. Like, it's also starting to get into a bigger sort of a plot that has bigger implications than just fight this one vaddy in this one area because they've got someone hostage. And then, yeah, I actually think, like I said, at one point in time this was the best comic book film number three 1998 split i understand this came out before the other one but the point is my ranking might have changed over the years even though people might not understand this is a comic book film this is from a marvel comic it's obviously 1998's blade directed by Stephen Norrington, who you won't know the name of, hence he didn't do that many other really good films after this. But this one is fucking fantastic. It is a fabulous self-contained movie. Like, this is just a really good film. Forget comics. The premise is great. Like, the idea of, like, today walk, he's, like, got all the strengths of the vampires, but none of their weaknesses, and then he hates them because his mother was like, oh, that's set up already. You're in. You're in. The execution is really well done. Like, people will know the opening scene is fucking amazing. All the scenes with the vampires are really interesting. They simultaneously have sort of interview with a vampire type, old type vampire, but then you have the new, almost new Vorish vampires, or like, hey, I'm the vampire now. By the way, even hinting towards some of the things that will be extended in the second one, Guillermo del Toro. But in this one, I think the whole villain plot is dope. Like, the whole thing is going to become the blood god. It's so sick an idea because it's a traditional mythic idea with postmodern nods. The idea that even the vampires don't believe in their own mythology. They're like modern day humans who don't believe in religion and any of the past things and myths, etc. That's even a cool angle. By the way, as soon as you see Stephen Dorff, who was badass in this film, I actually was sad that his career as an actor didn't extend too much further. He wasn't as good in certain other roles. In this one, he's really well suited to play the villain. As soon as you see that scene where he's in the archives, listening to the source direct drum and bass call and response, like I already loved drum and bass anyway. And in the eight and the nineties. That's the, that's the sort of shit where it's so effortlessly cool. It's almost like The Matrix. And it has that sort of just swag to it when you're hearing that music and those scenes. I think actually, as well as Stephen Dorff, there's another great villain in it, which is obviously played by Udo Kier as like the traditional vampire. And what happens to him is quite well done, I think, in terms of lore. The style, in general, it's just a very stylistic, a very cool film. 
I mean, I love the fact that essentially Blade isn't a hero, is he? Sort of an anti-hero. He's fucked up in his own way as they explore in the film. It's got an amazing final action sequence or set of sequences that just stack together and build to a climax that you very rarely ever see in action films. They normally have a hard time doing the ending, fighting the baddie, finding a clever way to end the film. And then it is cheesy, but in the best ways. And then it's serious in the other times and the aesthetic is just dope. It's just a really cool film that doesn't pretend like, oh, it's comics and all silly. Ha ha ha, what's going on? Ooh, the puppet. No, no, this is like, it's trying to be like a vampire film, a sci-fi element that happens to come from a comic, but that's irrelevant. You don't need to know anything about the comic or the lore of the universe. It's all self-content and you don't even need to watch a sequel or ever have read the comic. It's just a really good film. Two little go. Number two is going to be The Dark Knight from 2008, of course, directed by Christopher Nolan, right? This is obviously, if you think of the beginning of the film, a film that is very ambitious. Like, for a Batman film, it really tries to explore a lot within one film. I mean, for a start off, the whole opening sequence is just a really brilliant cinema heist, right? What a great sequence in and of itself. Could be self-contained, could stop right there. So we'll go, wow, that was worth watching. How compelling. Then the whole Joker dynamic is fantastic. Yes, hero worship of people who just haven't seen the 1989 Batman, don't know that Jack Nicholson did a great job, or haven't read the comics, and therefore don't know the comics were adult and serious in the 80s and 90s and beyond that, and it wasn't this movie that changed it. And then lastly, because Heath Ledger died, everyone has to worship him and say he was doing an 11 out of 10 job, he's impossibly good at this role, and no one else can even do this role. I get all that, I don't have to be that person. So that angle is off-putting, but I can exclude that, and he did do a fantastic job in this film. It's easily his best performance in his career. I think he did a very, very strong job. Obviously, the sad thing is, if we'd have known he was going to die, you would have rewritten the plot ending so that the third movie would be decent because supposedly the third movie was going to be sort of the Joker coming back using Heath Ledger and could have done something with that but instead they had to change it up with the Two-Face angle didn't they? I actually think the cast is interesting because Christian Bale's very underused in this movie. I actually almost it's almost pointless he's in it. You could cast so many other people in his role aside from the physicality he brings to the role I don't really know what the point is and if people don't know apparently a lot of actually like yeah, good, uh, of that voice was added in post by Christopher Nolan that wasn't even just Chris, Christian Bale doing that because Christian Bale's a fantastic actor but you're just barely used in this film and he and then you've obviously got like I think Aaron Eckhart's a bagger when he's like not being two-faced when he's two-faced look he does his best with it but one that effect doesn't really hold up and then two it's just a shitty storyline and you, you just finish with the movie at that point in time Monty said it many times but it's a, it's a rant I've had I just think the third act is very weak on this film that and the whole boat thing of he'll blow hope Ah, oh, miss me with that. If you just could have just ended it after the second act well and then waited for a third film, I think this would be like maybe number one on the list. I think it would be a stronger film, actually, because it does have those massive third act issues. Look, the action scenes are amazing. Like all the driving ones. Yeah, they are fucking fantastic. By the way, I even think... This is, this is how you know it's a really good film. I'm not even a fan of Maggie Gyllenhaal in this one. I think she's kind of whatever, even though she can be an alright actress. I think actually the female casting is kind of whatever in this series until the third movie. The third movie actually has a pretty good one from both of them. The, the females cast in, the women cast in the first and then this movie, they're the, the most forgettable part of it. They're not doing a great job. They're not always working with lords, but even so, they're just not doing that great a job, are they? I actually think this one does draw a lot from the comics. It clearly is inspired by The Dark Knight Returns, things from year one. If you just read any, basically, of the really great 90s and 2000s ones, you're going to see elements of it clearly bled into this. I mean, basically, if you don't know, he did work with people on the script, etc., who are very familiar with comics, etc. I think like David S. Goyer or something, who's done loads of comic book films, right? Which, of course, leaves one film to go. Have you guessed what it is? If you've actually watched some of my shows, you might have, because it is X-Men Days of Future Past from 2014. Now, I'll just say, directed by Brian Singer, who did X2. So he's returning to the series, right? He's obviously doing when they did the, the reboot, the remake with the younger actors. But this one obviously allows you to have some of the older people as well. So quite interesting, right? What I'll say is this. I remember watching this film at the cinema. And when it finished, I messaged Monty on an app. And I just said... this. You should watch this bit. It's actually, no joke, one of the best films I've seen. Never mind comic book films. It's just really good, man. It's just a really good film. Like, it's, you're just going to enjoy it. Like, I love Magneto when he's done well. I despise it when he's done wrong. The villain angle with Magneto is fabulous in this one. 
Like, he gets a way to win in a way movies usually don't let a villain win, a la Thanos earlier. I think it's a way more grey movie with tangled motivations, different sort of gradations of how good someone is or how moral or virtuous they are. The casting is very strong, even though I don't know it can be as strong as the original X-Men movies. Michael Fassbender is fantastic. Just, just a really good job as Magneto. McAvoy's pretty good. I wouldn't say as good as Patrick Stewart at being Professor Xavier, but he's pretty good. I think Jennifer Lawrence actually does an underratedly good job as Mystique in this one. I think, again, it's just a movie that, like, it's it's long, but it's justified. I think some of the big action sequences are fucking epic and feel like, like some of those, like that one in front of the White House, that would just be like a double panel spread in the middle of the comp. That would be insane. That would maybe be like an extend out one where you'd get some mad detail, wouldn't it? Like, this is really good. And the way they use real life elements and time travel elements, and then all these different characters and elements being weaved in, it's a really well scripted film, in my opinion, that allows people to all of them all Motivations, all of their little arc, all their little battling back and forth in different angles. And it just tells it in a very compelling, but I would say satisfying way with a strong cast. This is, in my opinion, the best comic book film that was made. Now, you might notice, obviously, I left a lot off, didn't I? Like, where was The Dark Knight Rises? Like I said, obviously, I didn't include that. I could have been naughty and put The Fountain in one of my favorite films because he made it into a comic when he initially, with Brad Pitt and them, they didn't do the film. So he made a comic, but then he actually did go and do it as a film anyway. Also, let's be real. It's, that started as a film and then went to a comic, so I don't think that would really count. Road to Perdition's one, some people might not even know, is from a comic. I just think that's mainly just the acting performances carried that one more. It was a good film, certainly. Kick-Ass, I thought was pretty fun, but I don't know that it'd make my top 10. Um, the joke I could have done, I'll probably do a video on this one day, is that I could have put The Matrix, right? Because The Matrix, the joke is, some of it, I think, quite heavily borrows from or even copies Grant Morrison's The Invisibles. Like I say, maybe I'll do a little video on that one day to sort of open your eyes like I did at the end of some of the insight when I told people about how True Detective maybe had plagiarized elements in it. Things like Watchmen, the other Batman, etc. There's, there's, there's plenty more I could have gone with here, but I think this is a pretty strong 10 in light of the sort of conditions I set up at the beginning. Obviously, my main gig is over in esports on my main channel, but my side channel and all my content around my other interests here are kindly supported by my Patreon community on Thorin's side here. So do you want to ask me a question for my video AMA? Do you want to take part in a private one-on-one -on -one exclusive, never to be released, but recorded for you session? Call it consulting. Call it just a conversation if you want. Do you want to find out who upcoming guests are for the Thor Inquiry episodes? If any or other other perks like this take your interest check out the patreon link in the description box below and join Thorin's side today